when was your first experience of any specific goalkeeping coaching? And then if you can kind of blend that into, you know, when yeah. you started thinking about becoming a coach as well, a goalkeeping coach. Well, becoming a coach came earlier than my first goalkeeping, <laughs> which is um, my first specialised goalkeeping session um, was 1991. So I would have been 32 year old. Uh, Peter Bonetti used to come into Birmingham on a Monday um, and he used to do us on a Monday morning and then Coventry, I think, on a Monday afternoon until eventually um, every Monday we all used to go to Coventry. So that's Birmingham City, West Brom. So Stuart Naylor and Mel Reese, God bless him, from West Brom. Myself, yeah. Roger Hansbury from Birmingham. Big Augie, uh, John Gould would go. At Co- and we'd all have a goalkeeping session with Peter Bonetti at Coventry on a Monday, which it just wouldn't happen now. Um, and that was my first goalkeeping coaching I've ever had in my life. And I'll, I'll never forget, Peter came to one of the, the Birmingham games and on the Monday he said oh, I was at the game Saturday I said oh okay um, what do you think he said I think on crosses when the ball is near the touchline he said I think you come too close to your near post so I went honestly now Tim I went off the train and down. I went straight to the club shop who at the time was selling the VHS videos yeah, I bought the video from the club shop, took it home, 100%. Ball's near the touchline. I'm literally standing next to my near post. And I'm thinking, I didn't even know I was doing it. Yeah. And, I'm, you know, I'm 31. I played 600 games. I played international football at every level. Yeah, all of a sudden, I got somebody saying to me, you know, when the ball is there, you know, don't get sucked into your near post. There's no need. Um, and then on the coaching side, I um, I was about 25, 26, and uh, Barney Jones, who worked for Northumberland FA, offered to run a level two at Newcastle United. So there was myself, Glenn Roder, Paul Goddard, um, Neil McDonald, I think. Uh, Gaza started the course, didn't finish it. Um, Jimmy, Jimmy Five Bellies, Gaza's mate, made up yeah. numbers. Um, and Barney put on a level two. Um, and all I'd wished is, in hindsight, is I wished I'd started coaching younger because I think I would have been a better goalkeeper for it. Um, in terms of my game understanding, everything I did, I must have just done naturally and, yeah, you know. When I look at all, because I have got some old footage of games, and when I look at them now, you know, I'm, I cringe because I think, look how far I'm coming down the line, you know. But nobody told me any different. Yeah. So I think we got there through probably more luck and judgment, you know. But we must have had yeah. a must have had a talent. Um, and I, I then went after taking my level two at 26. It was at Birmingham when I was 30, 31. Greg Downs was a player and he was doing a prep course. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, once you've done your level two, it's a course that can sort of elevate you. He said, I'm going to Nottingham. I said, I'd like to do that. So I, I actually did my my advanced license or full bad yeah. at 31. Okay. So what did them, it, it doesn't surprise me, like your, your, um, your curiousness and your interest in coaching and where it led you. But what did some of them first, what did some of them first goalkeeping sessions look like? Um, one, the ones that you were involved in, and two, some of the ones that you probably invented yourself. Talk us through what they look like. Yeah, the um, as I say, Peter was my the first coach, and Peter um, Peter worked with goalkeepers um, in the way that he was developed. So it was very much drill type practice, um, very much up and down. Uh, very much predictable in terms of you knowing knowing where the ball was going. Um, we used to have some great discussions on um, Peter was about five foot ten at his tallest, and we and Augie was six foot four. You know, so Peter, when he used to to coach us, he used to tell us things. You know, 
sort of uh, generally what everyone should do. Um, and Peter had a thing about using the top hand. Yeah. And Oggy just wouldn't use the top hand at all because he was six foot four and he would just launch his, this leading hand out and make yeah. saves. And Peter used to say to him, oh, you, you need to use the top hand, you know. And I used to use the top hand because I was, you know, I was probably in between them. So um, a lot of the a lot of the work definitely was defending the goal, you know, um, very little in terms of uh, any analysis um, of of matches. Um, at the time, it was um, prior to the the back pass rule. Yeah, the rule so change. Yeah, we didn't have to didn't have to really deal with that. Um, he, but it was it was fantastic for him, you know, uh, to have him. Um, and it, because it was all new, it was just exciting. Yeah. Um, but when I when I started coaching myself, um, I I used to work with the, the goalkeepers over at Lillishaw, um two days a week. Um, so they were elite. I say elite goalkeepers, obviously deemed you know some of the best in the country at fifteen, sixteen. But at the same time, I always um, I also used to go to Norwich and work with Brian Gunn and Andy Marshall and Green, yeah. Robert Green. So I had, you know, one day I'd be with a 15-year-old and then the next thing I'd be with a Scottish international. So I think I got exposed to that quite early. So managing difference became um, just the, the regular thing, you know, who am I working with today? Yeah. And, and I think you go through... You go through the stages of, um, I've got every video I think that's ever been produced on goalkeeping, whether that's English or whether it's foreign. Um, I think I've got every book. Um, so I'd always sort of research what was doing. This was pre-YouTube. Um, and then you go through a stage of the gimmicky type drills and then... You look at it and you go, well, yeah, realism, no. Nah. And you end up going back a lot to things that are tried and trusted and far yeah. more relative to the game. So I, yeah. I do think you go a full circle. Yeah, I agree with that. It, it sounds like you worked out quite quickly that you needed to, um, you know, ad adapt yourself as a coach depending on who you were working with. Would that be would that be accurate? Yeah, yeah. I, I'd, um, I think... When I look back at Lillishaw, I think that environment was absolutely invaluable for me because what you had was uh, not only day-to-day, -day, the likes of sort of Keith Blunt, um, who was brilliant at working with 15- and 16-year-old lads, not in terms of their football knowledge, um, and um, but just socially, because, of course, the kids lived at the 16 uh first year 16 second year they all lived at um all lived at Lillishall so they're all residential mm. and Craig Simmons was obviously there at the time so I remember me and Simo this was 90 it was before I joined the FA full-time so it was about 95 and Simo was doing a, a degree at university and they were talking about the four corners so you know, the four corners 25 years ago, and Simo just explained, you know, basically it's just looking at the holistic player, not just looking at yeah. the top tack, yeah. you know. So he planted a seed straight away. So it, those sort of environments you couldn't help but learn from, and the likes of Dave Sexton and um, Don Howe used to come into the school and do sessions. Oh, wow. um, and then I'd have the pro environment, you know, over at Norwich, of, yeah. um, Mike Walker was there at the time. Um, you know, the club was on a real high, to be fair. Um, that pro environment then of, of just being in and picking the brains of Guinea, you know, um, was um, was a fantastic opportunity. And, and then having the talent of sort of Andy Marshall and Robert Green coming through, it was... Yeah. Uh, yeah, a bit of everything. You got some. You got some great exposure. One from, one from what you did as a player, um, and secondly from some of the people you were you were around. What um, what advice would you give to a um, 
Well, two bits of advice. What advice would you give to a, a young up and coming coach who was kind of fresh to the game? And then secondly, what advice would you give to, you know, an ex-pro um, from the male or female game who was, you know, thinking about stepping into the coaching world? Uh, I think for the young coach, um, and I think this is probably one of the, um, I, th- I say problems, it's not a problem, it's just one of the challenges of for young coaches today. And I think we're all guilty of it. We ask them to think about so many things. Um, but what I would say to the young coach is the technical and tactical side of the game, um, really, uh, for me, the base knowledge and understanding underpins everything. Because I think if you've got that in terms of, um, you know, how you deal with people, how relationships, um, you know, in terms of your practices and your design. But I think I think the game comes first. And I think at times what we do is we, we give them a lot of everything and mm-hmm. they've got to sort it out for themselves. So the one thing I would encourage them, even if they are goalkeeping coaches, would be to definitely go through the mainstream pathway in terms of understanding what the game looks like, both in possession, yes, which people always talk about now, but actually the out-of-possession yeah. side. And I am still very heavy. I know in terms of my mentality now I'm wired. And and when I coach, I'm still very much the tactical side of it. Mm. I think um, for the for the older pro um, who's just coming out of it, whether male, female, I think the biggest challenge for them is not necessarily uh, the the technical side of the game. I think they understand that the they can have um, the tactical side of the game. I think they understand, but it needs to be drawn from them. But yeah. the biggest, biggest challenge challenge for them is they've only ever been um, if they've only ever been pros. We, 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 you know, we were all selfish when we were pros. It was about us. And really, once you become a coach, it's not about you. You know, it is about the players. Yeah. So building those relationships, how you best do it, how you best manage, um, being open-minded. Um, and I think the ex-pro as such probably needs a bit more help on the actual organization and management of sessions than the actual detail so yeah. i think that's why the courses can be so well received because the ex pro will talk to other coaches about the way they organize and the way they progress and manage and design and then the the young coach who hasn't experienced you know the the play inside of it at, at that level it's a great opportunity for them to pick the brains of the of the experienced pro. Yeah, 